Hey, Saddleback family. Uh, good to be with you today. It's a really exciting moment for me, but I do feel at home. I feel at home, and uh, I'm so excited to be with you and be able to share uh, God's word with you. Uh, as Pastor Tom said, I'm um, the campus pastor of Saddleback in Espanol. I get the privilege to be able to lead that campus and be part of that campus. And I get to speak Spanish on the weekends, which is great, uh, and half of the, half of the uh, time in my life. And um, and so we love what's happening at our, our campus, and thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying for all the campuses across Southern California and our, our international campuses as we gather. I love the fact that we're a family. And, and so I'm going to just say a quick hello to my, my campus, my Espanol campus. Así que familia, gracias. Los extraño mucho. Uh, gracias por estar conectados. Los amo mucho. Los extraño. Nos vemos la próxima semana. Y a todos los latinos en Saddleback Church, esta es tu casa. Nosotros somos una iglesia. Somos una familia. And basically what I said is that we're not just a church. We're a, we're a church family. And so uh, I get to do that every weekend. And so it's uh, so great to be with you. You know, I have a beautiful family. I want to show you a picture of my family. It's going to show up here, and uh, this is my uh, family. I have a daughter that's uh, nine years old. Her name is Kalia, um, and I have twin boys, uh, Judah and Levi. They're six-year-old, so, so please pray for me um, because, you know, we got twins at home. And then my beautiful wife, uh, Nada, uh, we've been married for about 10 years. I told Nada when we got married, uh, I, am the, I am God's will for your life, and, and it worked. It worked. So... Today I want to share with you a part of scripture uh, that has really encouraged me, um, especially in the last season and the last couple of months that we've been living. And, and every time I feel maybe a little tired or a little overwhelmed or, or I start, you know, getting a little grouchy and whiny towards the Lord, I always go back to this part of scripture. And we're going to read it today, and I'm going to encourage you to take out your message notes uh, as you came in. They give you a bulletin, and your message notes are right in there. And it's a story, it's a part of Scripture that combines compassion, action, and a great miracle. It's a story about five loaves of bread and, and two fish. And, and you find this story in all the Gospels. You find it in, in Mark and in Matthew and Luke and in John. And so it's a very, very precious story, probably one of my favorites. And so I'm going to ask you to take out your notes with you. And we're going to talk about this, this moment in Scripture with five loaves of bread and two fish and what Jesus does with that, this great miracle. And so it's out of Matthew chapter 14. I'm going to read it to you, verses 13 to 20. You can follow me uh, there with your message notes. And it says this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Verse 15 says, as evening approached, the, disciple came, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy this, themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. In verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves of bread and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people, and they all ate and were satisfied. What, what a moment in Scripture. And if you can turn that paper around, we're going to look at some points uh, there. We're going to camp on that Scripture today. And we, we're going to fill out some, some points here. But, you know, what I find interesting is that Jesus, in this part of Scripture, uh, it, we see the compassion that Jesus had for people. If you read a little bit before these verses, you find that Jesus just got the bad news that one of his best friends, uh, John the Baptist, just got murdered. And, and he's trying to process this. He's, he's in this moment of pain. And it's possibly why he, he's trying to get away and he's trying to look for a secluded place. But as he's trying to find a place to kind of process this and, and figure out what's going on, people follow him and they're hungry. And, and I find it really interesting that a Jesus was fulfilling people's needs when he himself was in need. When he's processing something so uh, dramatic and, and hurtful, he's fulfilling people's needs while he himself is in need. 
It's like Jesus telling us exactly what compassion is. It's, it caused him to take action. And so I, I love that, and that's where this story starts. Uh, Jesus fulfilling people's needs even when he was in need. You know, let me, let me ask you this question. Have you ever uh, asked a question uh, hoping to get the, the right answer, hoping for a specific answer back? Like you just asked a question, but you already know what the response is. And you're just asking, you're just hoping, yeah, that's, that's going to be the answer. This is kind of what's happening here. The disciples are, are telling Jesus, Jesus, the people are hungry. The people are hungry. Can you please send them away? And the disciples are hoping that Jesus or expecting that Jesus would say, yes, of course they're hungry. Send them out. That's what the disciples were expecting that Jesus would respond. But I love the way Jesus responds. And I'm sure they were shocked by what he said. And he said this, they don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. And it's interesting to me that, that the disciples had compassion, just like Jesus. He had compassion for people. The disciples also had compassion for them. But their compassion wasn't accompanied with action. For them, compassion in that moment was just a feeling it was just I feel bad for them. I, I'm compassionate for them. But it didn't take them beyond that. It, and so they said, send them away. Jesus says, no, you feed them. So the, the disciples, what they did is they really looked around and they saw there is a lot of people here. And, and they said, there's, there's about, the Bible says about 10,000 men. But if you put it all together, families, about ten to 15,000 people. The Bible says 5,000 men. But about 10, 15,000 people, about kind of what it feels to me right now. I'm like, whoa, it's a lot of people. And so what they're saying is, Lord, the need is way too big. The need is too big. There's too many people. We don't have what it takes to fulfill the need. They had compassion, but they lacked faith. They had compassion for the people, but, but they lacked the faith. See, the, the disciples, what they were lacking really was imagination. They had compassion, but they lacked imagination. They were just with Jesus who turned water into wine. And they loved people. They saw the need of the people, but they lacked imagination. You know, I, I love this, this verse in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 that says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And so what, what the disciples needed to be, they needed to be people of compassion, with great compassion, but also people with great faith, great imagination. And, and sometimes in order, when we see people's needs or the needs uh, in front of us, we need to have great compassion, but we also have to have great imagination. See, the, the disciples needed to be dreamers for a moment. They needed to be people that say there's a big need, but what could happen if Jesus is involved? They needed to be dreamers for a second. They needed to think outside of the box. And what I've learned in, in my walk of faith, this is what I've seen, is that when faith and compassion meet, great things happen. When, 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 when faith and compassion meet, people are transformed. Lives are changed. Communities are transformed. People are healed. 15,000 people are fed when compassion and imagination meet. And I always constantly remind myself when I look at this part of Scripture, well, you need to be a pastor or a person with great compassion, but just the same, you gotta, you got to be a person with a great imagination. you got to be a person with great pa compassion, but a person of great faith. Because that's the way that miracles start to happen. And I can't help to think about our lives sometimes. You know, we, we, we look at the needs in our family. And sometimes you look at the needs in your family, in your community, and what's going around you at work, in your school, and you say, wow, it, the, that need is just too big. It's just too big. And, and we, we tend to ask God this way. We, when we look at big needs that we just think we can't fulfill, we tend to say things like this. God, would you bring someone capable enough to fulfill that need? Or, or we'll say, God, would you bring someone with the right skill or with the right quality? I, and I know I pray that when I see a big need in my family or our church. I would say, Lord, can you bring the right person? And you know what God normally does? He answers this way. He doesn't answer the way I expect it, but he answers this way. Uh, why don't you do it? 
You, you feed them. You can fulfill the need. And I've learned this often, that if God allows me to see a need, it might be because he will give me the ability to fulfill that need. And it could be that God allows you to see a need because you have the potential to fulfill the need. See, the disciples were focused on their limitations, what was limiting them. The scripture says if you're reading in all the gospels, you'll find words like this. They were saying, this is a remote place. You know, some of the scripture says, this place is desolate. This place is secluded. Other parts of the scripture say that this place is empty. They were using words that describe their limits. They saw the need. They saw the need in the people. But they were saying, we are so limited. Look at what we can't do. Look at this place is empty. And if we can be honest for a moment, we all tackle that problem of putting limitations on ourselves. I know I do. You know, I see a need in my family or in my, my community, and, and I tend to say, man, but I wish I could, but I really can't. And, and I see the need, but there's no way that I can accomplish it. We say phrases like, I wish I could do it, but I can't because of, and then we list a bunch of limitations or a bunch of reasons why we can't do it. And in your, in your outline there, you can, you can fill out your first point. And your first point is this. There is more potential in you than there are limitations. And that's the truth. There is more potential in you than there are limitations. You were created with great potential. You weren't created with great limitations. En ti hay más potencial que limitaciones. God is not limited by our limitations. Dios no está limitado por tus limitaciones. We've been created with a great potential. And, and sometimes we, 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 people tend to think this way. And people take more time on thinking what can go wrong than what can go right. If I can be honest with you for a little bit, when I got asked to speak this weekend, I started thinking of all the things that can go wrong. I can probably fall off the stage. I'm probably going to faint. <laughs> or I'm, I was thinking of all the things that can go wrong. But then a friend told me, don't worry, think about what could go right. And I thought, maybe lives will be transformed today. You know, God will do something in someone. If, if it's not somebody else, it might just be me. And we focus so much on what can go wrong, and we don't focus on what can go right. Can I ask you this question? When you look at the need in your community, in your family, in your school, think about what could go right. Not so much what can go wrong. Stop placing limitations on yourself. You know, the reality is this too, if we're honest, the world is in great need. Especially after the seasons and the, the couple years that we're going through. The world is in great need. And the world needs believers that not only have compassion, but can imagine what God can do through them. That they can imagine and be creative in the way that God can work through them. So the disciples tell Jesus, Jesus, the need is way too big. Send them away. And Jesus says, nope, you feed them. And what do the disciples do? What do they do? They respond and they say, well, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. That's all we got, Jesus. You know, there's 15,000 people. We only got five loaves and two fish. And, and, and this, this meal was a humble meal. The Gospel of John says that it was a boy that provided this meal. It was like the type of meal that a Jewish family would take when they would travel. It wasn't supposed to fulfill, you know, a, a big need. It was just enough for you to travel. It's like, what do you do when you go on a road trip? What do you do? Well, I'll tell you what we do. You saw that I have three kids. My first stop is a gas station. And we fill up, and then we go in, and we get snacks, we get chips, we get drinks, we get, we get candy. We just fill up on snacks. Might be a bad thing. Don't judge me. That's what we do. And so we do that, it's just enough snacks for the trip. You know, uh, when I grew up, I, I'm, I was born in Guatemala, uh, Central America, and, and I wasn't, uh, my parents weren't that nice. <laughs> and so our road trip food was mom waking up at 5 in the morning, getting some tortillas, putting some ham, lechuga, le ponía salsa, picante, y lo amarraba, and she made a breakfast burrito for us. I'm getting hungry now. And so she, she would make that for us. And that was our, our travel food. That was our road trip food. We ate breakfast burritos all day. That's what we did. And, you know, that, that's what this is. This is a meal that's not supposed to satisfy everybody. It's just enough for that family. So what do they do? 
They bring this humble meal, these five loaves of bread and two fish, and they give it to Jesus. And they place it on the hands of this. This boy gives it to Jesus, and the miracle happens. And the, the, everybody gets satisfied. And I don't know if you can imagine for me for a moment, but think about this. There's 15,000 people hungry, probably hangry, if you know what, I'm, you know what I mean by that. They were hungry, probably getting upset, and then this little boy comes and he gives it these five loaves and two fish to Jesus. And just imagine that picture. But somehow, in the hands of Jesus, this becomes enough. And it's really a picture of what Jesus does, and it's more of a picture of who Jesus is. It's an example for us of how we ought to bring our life to him. That, that even though it might not seem much, but if we place it in, in his hands, he will make much of it. And your next point is this. You can fill out in, in your, your message notes this. Our lack of resources in the hands of Jesus transforms into an abundance. And nuestra falta de recursos en las manos de Jesús se transforma en una abundancia. All of a sudden, it was placed in the hands of Jesus, and it was just more than enough. And, and every time compassion and faith and imagination meet, the miracles happen. And this is why I love this part of Scripture. I love it because we, we tend to put so much limitations on ourselves where God is saying, can you just believe in me? Can you just hope and can you just believe in the best and let me work and let me provide the miracle? We forget that God does not need resources. He, he creates them. And so God, God teaches us and Jesus teaches us in this moment of what he can do when we're willing to offer ourselves. And so he does three things. And I love it. He does three things with this, this humble offering. That's why I love scripture. I don't know when you read scripture. I, I love it because as you dig into it, you find so much into it. And it's so descriptive of what Jesus does with this humble offering. I'm going to share it with you. And my hope is that as we look at this, we, we can, at the same, in the same way, offer our lives to him. What does he do with the humble offering? What does he do with the breakfast burrito? No, I'm sorry, the five loaves of bread and, and two fish. What does he do with that? He does this. Point number one, he does. He, he, he gives thanks. Dio gracias. He was thankful. He gives thanks. Dio gracias. Verse 19 says, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. I love that. And, and, I, and I'm so glad that that was that part of that scripture because he started by giving thanks. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, one of the things I want to ask Jesus is, what, what, what did you say in that prayer? What was in that prayer that just, man, made everything multiply? What was it? Well, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but scholars say that most likely Jesus would have prayed the blessing of the bread, the traditional prayer of blessing for the bread. And the prayer will go something like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. That's what he prayed. That was in Spanish, by the way. Okay, that was in Spanish. But, um, it, but basically, it's such a powerful prayer, and I love it. That's why I studied it and, and got really into it, because this prayer was this. This is what the prayer was. It says, blessed are you, God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. It's such a beautiful prayer. And Jesus, what, he says, what he's saying is he's being thankful for the bread. It's a different type of prayer. He's thanking God for what's in his hands. He's thanking God for the bread that has been provided. And this is powerful. And, and we can take a, a moment to look at this context because there's 5,000 people that need to, need to eat. And there's only five loaves of bread. And Jesus' his prayer was not, God, can you provide more? His prayer was not, Lord, we need more bread. No, his prayer was, God, thank you for the bread that you provided. And it's such a powerful teaching. And that word bless, when he blessed the bread, it really can be translated as praising God for the bread. So if you can just imagine for a moment, Jesus is grabbing this bread and he's looking up to heaven. There's 15,000 people that are hungry. And the first words that come out of his mouth are, thank you. Thank you for this bread. There's a huge need. 
people are probably screaming. I don't know what, they, if they were my kids, I mean, there'd be some kids crying for food. And, but they're saying, but the first words that he says is, thank you. And I love that. And, and it teaches us a huge lesson here. That before we ask, we must be thankful. Before we look at what we need or start asking about our needs, we got to thank God for what he's already provided. And if we can get it a little bit more personal, if we look at the life that we've lived in the last couple of years, I know we've lost much. I know it's been difficult. But if we can start by thanking God, I can assure you it will make a big difference. And he starts saying, thank you. And so Jesus is teaching the disciples a huge lesson. He knew the need, but he was thankful for what he had. He, he knew what he lacked, but he was grateful for what was in his hand. And, and I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, and, and, and I saw 15,000 people that are hungry, and I only got five pieces of bread and a fish, my prayer would have been like this. It would have been, Lord, you need to help me out. There's 15,000 people that are, that are in need right now that are, are probably crying, fighting. They're hungry. And I got some friends, some disciples that are trying to leave me. So, Lord, would you please give me more bread? Would you just provide more bread? Lord, would you please bring me more fish? And I would say, Lord, would you throw in some tacos in there? Because tacos just fix everything. That, that's what I would have prayed. I, I, my prayer would have been, give me more. Right? There's a great need. People need to eat. And my prayer would have been, Lord, can you provide more? Can you give me more? But Jesus didn't ask for more. He simply gave thanks. And I love that. And, and, and he first gave thanks. And, and I tend to pray opposite. When I'm in big need, when I'm, I'm asking for a lot, I make my prayer list becomes of all the things that I need. And I forget to, to give God thanks. And so it's a huge lesson that teaches us, that Jesus teaches, teaches us here. He flips everything. He knew that although the need was big, God was bigger. He knew that his resources were small, but God would provide. You know, I, when I go back to this part of scripture, and I remember journaling in this part of scripture, I remember I was in a season of great need. There was a lot of things I was asking God to do in my life. And I remember writing, because I needed a miracle in my life, I remember writing in my, in my journal, Will, if you need a miracle, start by giving thanks. If you need God will, if you need God to work in your life, start by giving thanks. And that's where it starts. And Jesus started by giving thanks. The first step to provision is being thankful. And we need to stop focusing on what we need and what we're lacking and start for a moment. Start thanking God for what we have. Jesus, in the midst of this great need, says thanks. You know, your point that you can fill out is this. One of the greatest realizations you can have about your life is the realization that you are blessed. One of the greatest realizations is the fact that you know that you are blessed. Uno de los más importantes descubrimientos que puedes hacer en tu vida es darte cuenta que eres bendecido. Blessed, bendecido. You are blessed, eres bendecido. And, and if we look at our, our, our our life for a moment, yes, we've gone through very difficult moments in the last year and a half, two years. And I'm not neglecting or, or di diminishing the fact that it's been a painful season. But what I am saying is that even in the midst of all the things that we need, we got to start by giving God thanks. And if I can go a little bit more personal to you, church family, for those that call Saddleback Church your, your home, and for those that you've given your life over to Jesus, it's been a difficult year, but, but if you have placed your faith in Jesus, let me tell you, you have it all. There might be things that you're lacking. There might be things that are painful. But if your life is in the hands of Jesus, you have enough. And so Proverbs says this. Proverbs 8.35 says, for those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. That's such an important reminder for me as, as, a, as a dad as a husband, as a pastor, when I see that I, there's much need, I need to remember, you know, my faith is in Jesus and I have enough. And that's why I can be thankful. And that's why I start with thankfulness. And so Jesus does this and he gets the bread and he, he prays and he, he thanks God. He blesses the bread. The second thing he does, the Bible says, is that he broke 
the bread. Partió el pan. He grabs the bread, he blesses it, and he broke the bread. Partió el pan. In, in, in this tradition, with the way that they would share a meal, that they would break the bread and they would share it with one another. So they would, people would pick a piece and that's how they would share the meal. And I've often asked this question, and maybe you have too. Where did the miracle happen? Have you ever asked that? Like where did it start multiplying? And I tried to look it up and I don't know where it is. But, but I, I do know that as soon as Jesus blessed it and he broke it, it multiplied. I don't know where exactly it happened, but the brokenness brought forth fruit. The, the fact that it, it was blessed and that it was broken, the bread was multiplied. It was this mix of blessing and, and brokenness that the miracle happened, that that was needed came to be, that the, that, that the fulfillment occurred. It, it, it was the blessing and the brokenness that was like the recipe for this miracle to happen. And you know, knowing that we're blessed feels so good. You know, uh, saying that, man, I, I got a purpose for my life. Jesus is on my side. I'm a blessed person. Feels so good. But when we get to the part of brokenness, that's why we don't like it so much. You know, brokenness never is a good thing for us. We, we never respond in, a, in, in an exciting way when we know that brokenness is coming. Broking, uh, breaking never is good. It, it's never a good thing, at least in my home. When things break, I told you I have kids, right? When things break, it's never a good thing. My first thought goes, when I hear something breaking around my house is, okay, uh, how much is it going to cost and who's going to get in trouble? You know, that's what I think. It's never a good thing when we, when we, when we go through these seasons of, breaking, of, of being broken. And we all love to be blessed, but we hate and we avoid the brokenness. Why? Because brokenness brings pain. Brokenness is uncomfortable. But, but we, we, and so what do we do? We try to avoid brokenness because it's too painful. And you can feel this in your points there in your outline. Uh, when we avoid times of brokenness, we will avoid the pain, but we will also miss the growth. Yes, you'll avoid the pain if you avoid times of brokenness. Yes, it won't be hurtful, but you'll also miss the growth. Cuando evitamos los tiempos de, de quebranto, nos libramos del dolor, pero también nos perdemos el crecimiento. See, in order to grow, pain is involved. You can't continue to serve God uh, pain-free. You know, you can serve him until a certain moment where it gets too difficult and I'm not going to go any further than that just until it gets uh, painful. No, and so what, what have I done? And I'm going to maybe share out of my heart. When it gets too painful, I, em I embrace the moments of brokenness. When God starts breaking some thoughts in my life, when God starts breaking some attitudes in my life, when God starts breaking some thinking or, or some, words, some words that I use, it, I, I embrace it. Why? Because I know that brokenness will bring fruit to my life when Jesus does it. That's where he takes me from glory to glory. And so instead of avoiding brokenness, we need to embrace it. You know, did you know that David was anointed king, but it took 10 years for him to actually become king? There was some stuff in his character that needed to be broken in order for him to become the great king of Israel. You know, Paul, the person that wrote most of the New Testament, he would spend a lot of moments in prison and, and moments of pain. But it's because of that that now we have most of what we call the New Testament. You know, the people of Israel spent 40 years in a desert going in circles, being broken just to come to realize who God truly is. Seasons of brokenness bring the most fruit out of you. So instead of avoiding them, we need to embrace them. And, and so God, Jesus, in this moment, he, it's this mix of blessing and brokenness that, that, that brought forth the miracle. And the third thing that Jesus did, not only did he bless it, not only did he break it, but finally the Bible says that he gave the bread out. Dio el pan. He gave it out. Matthew 14, verse 20 and 21 says this. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. I love that. I love the fact that he gave it and then there was left over. The result that 
was that everybody was satisfied, but there was 12 baskets full of broken pieces. I love that. Don't you love scripture when, when it adds those things in there? Full of broken pieces. You know, in, in that tradition, the servants would always eat last. You know, those that served would always eat last. And, and I, I wonder, I don't know if you wonder, when I look at scripture, I, I tend to ask a lot of questions and I wonder, I wonder what the disciples thought. You know, in Mark chapter 6, the Bible says that the, the disciples were also hungry. They hadn't ate all day. So 15,000 people are hungry. The disciples are hungry. And now the disciples are serving and giving. I wonder what they thought. And if they're anything like me, I'm probably one of the disciples who was like, you know, I, I'm giving. I don't, is, will there be enough for me? You know, um, you know, maybe I'll just put one of these pieces of bread behind my pocket and no one's going to see because I'm going to save that for later. Or, or let me put this fish right over here. Let me reserve that for me. I wonder what they thought. They were hungry too. And I wonder if they thought, if I continue serving, will I receive as well? If I continue giving, will I get to eat? If I continue helping somewhere, someone else's need, will my need be fulfilled? And I wonder what the disciples thought, you know, does Jesus know that I'm hungry too? Does he know that my need needs to be fulfilled as well? And I love the fact that scripture says there was baskets left over. And in that tradition, whatever was left over was always given to those that served. So imagine that great lesson for the disciples. They're probably asking, will my needs be filled? Well, at the end, they're walking out with one basket full. I remember reading this part of scripture as I was journaling one day, and as a pastor, and I, and I was in church, and I was thinking, Lord, I'm giving so much. Lord, uh, I'm in need of this miracle, and I'm helping so many people, and I'm giving of my time, and I'm giving of my energy. And I remember writing this in my journal, writing, Lord, do you know that I have needs too? I remember the Lord just speaking to me, and I write it, writing it in my journal, and, and, and I remember Jesus saying this, Will... If you serve my people, I will take care of you. And I stand here with, with, with full faith in my heart to tell you that Jesus has taken care of me. That's why I showed you that picture at the beginning, the picture of my family. Because I, I serve and I give and God always takes care of me. And it's that truth, it's, it's that assurance that if you continue to serve and you continue to obey the Lord, he will take care of you. And, and he does know your need. And I love this. When we meet others' needs, we know that our needs will also be met. The disciples had no idea that it was in them fulfilling someone else's need that their need was also going to be met. You know, maybe you're, you're a person that's constantly serving. Maybe in your home, you're the one that always gives. You're the one that works the hardest. You're the one that stays up late making sure everything's okay. You're the one that makes, wakes up early to, to get the kids ready or to make breakfast. Or you, you're the one that's always, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at school, maybe it's at church. Week in after week out, you're giving and you're wondering, does God know my needs? Well, can I, I can tell you today out of my pastor's heart, the Lord does know your need. And it's in that mix of being, knowing that it's blessed and being broken and being able to serve that God provides the miracle. And so Jesus does this. He, 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 he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he gives it. And the scripture reminds us that he knows our needs, he knows the people's needs, and he knows your needs. And can I tell you this? Uh, God is faithful. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And so you might be sitting, standing here today and being here today. It's like, man, I was, I was ready to just not serve anymore. I, I'm tired of, of giving and I'm not receiving. Well, can I tell you for a moment to just change your perspective a little bit? And God knows. He knows what you need. He knows the miracle that you're waiting for. And it could be in that serving that your miracle could be provided. So Jesus, he blesses it, he breaks it, and then he gives it. Then the miracle happening. And church family, can I ask you this question? I feel at home and I want to ask you this question. What miracle are you waiting for? Or, or what is the great need that you're asking God to fulfill? 
I know that I have some. And, and what is that for you? And it could be this recipe, this mix of blessing and brokenness and giving that God might be able to provide it. You know, I, 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 when I look at this part of scripture, I, I, I tend to ask this question and I, and I think, tend to say, I wonder if the boy for, had forgotten his meal. I have six, two six-year-olds, so they constantly forget their lunch when they go to school. I wonder if that day that little boy would have forgotten his meal. Or, or maybe that day he just didn't want to share. I wonder, and I'm sure Jesus would have done something, but, but, but he, he was there. The boy was there. He brought his meal, and he provided that meal. Just, just imagine for a moment this little boy. And if he's anything like a six-year-old twin, <laughs> the moment he probably gave the meal to Jesus, and then he saw what Jesus did and it multiplied, if he's anything like my kids, his eyes probably just popped up and were like, wow, what just happened? And it's a great example for us of like when we give what we have to Jesus, he will make much of it. Maybe today, maybe today your, 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 your response to this message is this, I want Jesus to use me. Maybe today your response is this, I'm going to give what I have and I'm going to place it in the hands of Jesus and I'm going to allow him to use me to create miracles all around. I'm going to allow him to be, for me to be a blessing in my family, in my school, in my community. Maybe that's the response you need to take and say, I, I, I don't think I have it all perfect. It doesn't seem like much, but I'm going to place it in the hands of Jesus and I'm going to let him create miracles through me. Maybe your response today is this. Maybe you've never given your life to the Lord and maybe today what you want to say is, I, I want to give my life over to Jesus. Doesn't seem like much, or, or I made many mistakes, and but I'm gonna trust and I'm gonna put my life in the hands of Jesus and watch him transform my need. You know, sometimes we make assumptions that, that Jesus is, is expecting a perfect life, or that we have to get it right in order to hand it over to Jesus. And that's so wrong. The reality is that when we humbly offer our life to Jesus, he always accepts it. You know, during the pandemic, my, my boys, uh, Judah and Levi, they started doodling with, uh, and drawing uh, so much during the pandemic. And they still do. I have like stacks of paper of their drawings. I'm probably going to give some out today as you walk out. I don't know what to do with them. You know, there's so many drawings. I don't know what to do. And, and so I tr I'm trying to throw them away, but they don't let me. But, you know, they started drawing. And I remember the first couple of drawings, my, my sons would come and say, uh, Daddy, I'm going to draw something for you. I'm like, okay, son, go ahead. And he'd come back 30 minutes later, and he'd say, hey, look, I drew a picture of Spider-Man. And I would look at that picture, and I'd be like, in my mind, I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> that looks nothing like Spider-Man. Okay, that, okay. But I wouldn't say that, of course, because I'm a, I'm a good dad. I wouldn't say that. But I would look at him and be like, wow, that looks nothing like Spider-Man. But that, what I would tell him, I would say, that is the best Spider-Man I've ever seen. And I would gladly accept it. Then I would take the, that, that piece of paper and I'd sit with them and I'd, I'd make it a little bit better. And, you know, as the year has gone by, they've gotten better. And Spider-Man is looking a little bit more like Spider-Man, sort of, not really. But, but every time they bring it to me, I say, wow, that is the best Spider-Man I've ever seen. And I feel like Jesus is the same way. He's never asking us for a perfect picture. He's never asking for the perfect offering. All he's asking us to do is to be able to trust him with our life. And it might not seem like much to you. It might seem little to you. But can I remind you, in the hands of Jesus, it becomes much. So maybe that's your response today. I encourage you to be like that little boy and, and give over your life to Jesus. Church family, I'd love to pray for you today. Why don't you close your eyes with me and as we end this time. Lord, thank you for your word that continues to inspire us. It also challenges us, Lord. And Lord, all of us here in our church, in this congregation, here at Saddleback, Lord, we all have different needs. And we're all asking for different things and we're all asking, Lord, for you to work in our lives. Some of us are asking for a big miracle. And, Lord, I, I, would, I would hope and my prayer is that first we start by thanking you. 
Lord, today we have a thankful heart. Thank you that although we do have a big need, Lord, you have provided with so much. Thank you that you love us and thank you that you're with us. And Lord, help us to allow you to work in our life, to be able to mold us, to break certain things, break certain thinking so that we can fulfill the need that you have for this world. And Lord, and help us to trust you, to trust you that as we serve and as we give and as we're obedient to what you're calling us to do, that you will fulfill our needs as well. You know, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to do that today, I encourage you to pray this with your eyes closed and with a big open heart. You can say this within you. You can say, Jesus, I need you. There is a big need in my life, and today I want to give my life over to you just as the boy gave his offering to you. I want to trust you. And Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and giving me a new life. And today I decide to follow you, and I declare that you are my Lord and Savior, and I belong to you. Lord, as a pastor of this church, Lord, I pray for our church, for Saddleback Church. Thank you for blessing us with this church. And I pray that in this season you would start molding us into the church that you want us to be. And that we continue to serve our community and that you continue to use us to fulfill the needs of this world. Lord, thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Why don't we give a hand to those that made that decision today and so great for you.